Hi all! I just got myself a portable black background, and I notice it shines quite a bit. Most likely, it's because it's made of plastic. I'm curious about how to make it blacker and what paint is needed for that. Well, let's just figure it out. Yes, the color black is definitely interesting, but besides it, there are also other dark pigments as well as light ones. I think we should start by looking at the most interesting pigments, as they can be not only vibrant, but also quite toxic. Interestingly, just like with some animals, a red color hints at danger, and the same goes for natural substances. The red color can indeed indicate that this substance is potentially unsafe. For example, let's take cinnabar, which is mercury sulfide and has a vivid, striking, vibrant and visually appealing red-orange color in appearance. You can discover this mineral in the vicinity of hydrothermal sources, where it is often mined and extracted, such as in geothermal areas. Working with such a pigment is very dangerous. Since it contains mercury, this substance is very toxic and therefore dangerous. But still not as dangerous as mercury itself. By the way, it can be easily obtained from cinnabar powder by simple heating. At high temperatures, mercury sulfide decomposes into sulfur and elemental metallic mercury, which easily evaporates and settles on the cooler walls. Checking. Creating a beautiful mercury mirror. Because of this, cinnabar is still the main mineral for extracting metallic mercury, and it is also sold as a quite expensive and highly sought after pigment for restoration artists. Besides cinnabar, there's also a very bright and toxic natural pigment, namely the aura pigment. From a chemical point of view, it is a naturally occurring arsenic trisulfide compound, and you can find it near geothermal sources or steaming sulfur fumaroles, such as. Like cinnabar, this pigment is very toxic and dangerous for humans, which however doesn't stop its use. Today, it's not only used as a rare coloring agent, but also as a raw material for making glass, infrared cameras, and semiconductors, where they add arsenic impurities to silicon to create a P-type junction, for example. Interestingly, many bright natural pigments can often be toxic. But in reality, nature is not that simple, and even a regular white pebble can turn out to be toxic. Let's take, for example, this mineral, cerasite. It is the main carbonate of lead, which has been commonly and extensively utilized since ancient times, historically as lead white, as a pigment. They were highly valued and highly sought after because of their immaculate and pure white color and good covering ability. However, it is not often found in nature. That's why lead white was mainly produced artificially. They started making them ancient times. The Roman historian Pliny wrote in the 1st century AD that this paint was made by the action of the most potent vinegar on the finest lead scraps in the ancient world. But over time, more effective and carefully selected methods for producing this pigment were found. The very oldest Dutch method involves first taking thin lead sheets. Lead sheets were carefully and gently rolled into spirals and then placed in clay pots that were glazed on the inside. A little acetic acid was poured into the bottom of these pots. These pots were carefully covered with lead plates and then stacked several layers on top of each other. And they were buried in horse manure. The carbon dioxide released during the decomposition of manure, along with acetic acid, reacted with lead, causing the metallic lead to convert into the basic carbonate, and that white coating of lead white formed on the surface of the lead. This coating was carefully scraped off, thoroughly dried, ground, and washed. Producing this white paint required a significant amount of money and time, regardless of the method used, which is why the price was sky high. To check how white those lead ones were, lead white. I took it in its pure form and mixed it with bleached linseed oil. Which artists have been using, extensively and widely used, as a paint thinner since the Middle Ages? Because lead is, as you might expect, a relatively heavy metal, its basic carbonate is also quite dense and therefore doesn't mix very well with linseed oil. So I just mixed it with the oil as best as I could. After that, I applied these lead whites to the canvas with a regular brush so that in the future I could determine which of the whites is the whitest. Besides lead whites, there are also antimony whites, which are antimony oxide obtained by roasting its natural mineral, antimony, or antimony sulfide. They are indeed also quite dangerous as antimony compounds are toxic. However, I also mix this white powder with linseed oil, which is a good thing. This pigment spreads much better than lead whites, and it also applies to canvas much more easily. In addition to the toxic lead and antimony whites, I also took more modern zinc whites for comparison, which I also applied to the canvas. 
After that, I took another type of white pigment, barium whites, which are barium sulfate. It's also used as a contrast agent for scanning the intestines. Barium compounds are quite toxic in themselves, but due to the incredibly low solubility of barium sulfate in water, this substance is generally considered safe. The opacity of barium whites is low, so they are rarely used. Applied modern whites, titanium whites, titanium oxide. Well, to wrap things up, I applied the most modern whites, titanium whites, which are pure white titanium oxide. This substance is considered relatively safe. Although it has been banned for use as a food additive in the European Union since 2022, and to finally compare all these whites with the whitest substance at the moment, I also made paint from fine powder of Teflon, which looks a bit whiter compared to titanium whites. I very carefully apply the paint made from this powder over the existing paints, and then I leave it like that for a month, carefully. To let the linseed paint dry a bit, and also to reveal any possible shortcomings of some whites. Zinc whites did not yellow. They hold up best over time. It turned out that only zinc oxide or zinc whites did not yellow and remained unchanged after a month on the balcony. But the lead, antimony and titanium whites have slightly yellowed in the sun. This is especially true for lead whites as they darken over time when exposed to air because they turn into black lead sulfide. Well, as you can see, in some places the white paint based on Teflon also performed quite well. So indeed, zinc oxide and Teflon share the top spot for whiteness. Which pigment is the blackest? Can paint be blacker than black? Only an absolutely black body can be. And is it possible to make paint blacker than black? In fact, only an absolutely black body can be blacker than black. And it's actually quite easy to make one yourself. To do this, I just took a toilet paper roll and painted the inside black. After that, I sealed both ends. The only thing is, on one side I left a small hole. Now, the light that enters inside can no longer escape outside. This black hole can be considered almost an absolutely black body. I wonder if any paint can replicate this effect. One of the oldest dark pigments was galena, a shiny mineral of such a dark gray color. Because of its shiny texture, this substance was often used by ancient Egyptians for eye makeup, although they probably didn't know about the toxicity of this pigment, as it consists of lead disulfide. Apparently, such a calm, dark grey colour of this mineral did not hint at danger. Right now, this mineral is currently primarily used to obtain lead, as well as silver, which can be up to 1% in this pigment. To check just how very black Galena can be, I carefully took a canvas and divided it into equal parts which I will paint with different paints based on black pigments. So it will quickly become clear which paint is the darkest. I decided to start with Galena, the powder of which I mix with linseed oil, and then apply it to the canvas. And so we continue. So far, this paint looks pretty black, but let's see how the others perform, because everything is understood in comparison. Besides Galena, the ancient Egyptians and also the ancient Greeks used other black pigments for coloring. The same goes for ceramic vases, as Galena easily decomposes during firing. For example, one of the first black pigments was ground pyrolocyte mineral, or manganese dioxide. Interestingly, this substance is also notable for being a very good catalyst. In some reactions, for example, when it's added to hydrogen peroxide, it starts to decompose very quickly into water and pure oxygen. This is all because manganese dioxide accelerates the decomposition reaction of hydrogen peroxide, which under normal conditions occurs very slowly. For my black painting, I mix it, as before, with linseed oil, and then apply it to the canvas. As you can see, this pigment is already much darker. Galena. So for now, pyrolocyte can be called the blackest pigment. That's for now. However, since ancient times, magnetite, which is a mixed iron oxide, has also been used as a pigment. It's also called Mars, black. It can be mined using a shaft method, as this mineral is also the main source of iron. Magnetite fully lives up to its name, as due to the special arrangement of electrons between the two mixed iron oxides, it has quite strong magnetic properties. To find out how black this paint will turn out, I first mixed the commercially available pigment Mars Black, and then I applied it to the canvas. Overall, the paint turned out to be quite dark. Besides the purchased pigment, 
I also got curious about grinding this piece of magnetite that I brought from an Italian mine a couple of years ago. This mineral is hard. Chipped a piece, used grinder, got magnetite stones, ground further. Then I started carefully grinding it in this improvised crushing device that I made the day before, and slowly, after rough grinding, I got magnetite stones, which I then decided to carefully and meticulously grind in a coffee grinder. Due to the high hardness of magnetite, this process took 20 minutes. However, not all the pieces of magnetite were able to be ground down, so I sifted the larger stones using a sieve, and then I ground everything again in the coffee grinder. In the end, I ultimately got this dark magnetite powder, which I'm actually mixing with linseed oil, resulting in black magnetite paint. But still, when applied to the canvas, it's clear that the degree of grinding here isn't the same as in the purchased sample of Mars Black, which is why the paint doesn't lay down as smoothly, and the color turns out to be more gray. Besides metal oxides, one of the very first black dyes that humans started using was regular charcoal, which as you can see works great for drawing on paper. Charcoal consists of large sheets connected by carbon atoms, which easily separate from each other. Under mechanical impact, besides coal, there is also a mineral based on it, for example shungite, which is mainly composed of carbon mixed with impurities of aluminum and silicon oxides. It looks like this black stone. To make a pigment from it, it needs to be ground first. You can do this efficiently in a machine that can grind even the hardest stones using very hard ceramic burrs. After several stages of fine grinding, we ended up with this black powder, which can already be used as a base for paint. As with other pigments, I mix the shungite powder with linseed oil, and then I apply it to the canvas. It's interesting, but by appearance this is so far the blackest paint I've made. And that's not surprising. Since the carbon in shungite is essentially amorphous, it means it reflects extremely little light. Besides amorphous carbon, Shungite also contains several other forms of carbon, which I recently talked about in my video. In it, we obtained fullerenes, which have every chance of becoming popular nanomaterials. Extensively used in both industry and medicine, they are obtained in a vacuum by burning graphite rods in an inert atmosphere. During this process, a lot of byproduct is formed in the form of carbon black, consisting of all possible types of carbon. I became curious about what would happen if I mixed this soot with linseed oil and how black the resulting paint would be. As you can see it draws just great on paper. But how exactly black will it indeed be compared to other black pigments? When applied to the canvas, it definitely looks extremely promising, since the color turns out to be a bit darker than that of shungite. But I still have one section left on the canvas, which I decided to paint with the blackest pigment. According to the literature, specifically nanotubes. If you look online, you can easily discover that the blackest coating, Vantablack, consists of vertically aligned nanotubes. So maybe I can create a paint based on them. For this I bought these nanotubes. They are already predispersed in some substance to make it easier to dissolve them in various solvents. They are obtained in a similar way to fullerenes, but the purification here occurs in an even more complex way than the fullerenes themselves. When I tried to dissolve these nanotubes in linseed oil, I wasn't really able to get a uniform mixture. To get a more or less liquid mixture, I diluted it with white spirit, but that didn't help much. The paint still turned out with some lumps. In the end, I decided that maybe it would get better after drying. That's why I decided to apply this improvised paint to the canvas. Perhaps after the solvent evaporates and the linseed oil polymerizes, the color will become darker. Let's take a look at this after some time. After a month of the paints drying, it's clear that the paint with nanotubes has dried a bit. And it started to look much darker. Basically, if you look at it from different angles, you could say that it turned out to be the blackest of them all. But still, it doesn't seem blacker than black. It seems that the nanotubes need to be dissolved in some unusual solvent, which I think will be hard to find. 
But that's not a problem, because the Japanese have already figured out what to dissolve these nanomaterials in and created a paint called Misu Black. By the way, it costs quite a bit, around 60 euros for this little job. I'm curious how black it will be after applying it to the canvas. To create some sort of comparison, I have already pre-painted this canvas with black acrylic paint based on carbon black. A day after drying, I'm painting something resembling a black hole in the middle of this canvas using the nanotube based paint. In its wet form, this paint really does look quite black. I think we need to wait for it to dry a little bit more and see what it turns out like. After a day, in normal lighting, this paint really does look very black, but it all depends on the angle of view. It's all because here, apparently when drying, some of the nanotubes stand vertically to the surface, while others are arranged randomly. Why is the light absorbed between them better than regular acrylic paint? You can see that most of the painting has a bit of a shine, but the black hole painted in the middle absorbs much more light, which makes it look darker. An even more unusual effect. So if you paint a mandarin or an orange with this paint, for example, this effect is more noticeable against a white background, as with such contrast, even the shape of the mandarin is faintly visible, since this paint absorbs so much light. I also tried painting a metal corner, which on white paper really creates the effect of an absolutely black body. According to the manufacturers, this paint absorbs 99.9% .9 of visible light. I think they might have exaggerated a bit, but for now, this paint can still be called the blackest of them all. All left is to learn the secret from the Japanese about the solvent for carbon nanotubes, and you can support this paint yourself. Of course, to create an even blacker surface, the tubes need to be grown in a perfectly vertical position on the object being painted, using gas transport deposition. But in this case, the same mandarin or orange could simply burn from the heat in the vacuum chamber, and it would be more accurate to call it a coating rather than paint. Well, I think after this video, you learned what the blackest paint is made of and how it can be made. Well, if you enjoyed this video, as always, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to learn even more new and interesting things.